and welcome back to day four of the first ever Kids Brain Health Virtual Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Goldman, and this afternoon we're going to continue exploring the sub-theme, moving online and harnessing the lessons of COVID-19. Up next, we have a session that's designed to provide some real talk on developing policy recommendations. The session is called The Road to Canada's National Autism Strategy, the Policy Development Process and Learnings from Community Stakeholder Collaborations. This session will be moderated by Jonathan Lai, Director of Strategy and Operations at Canadian Autism Spectrum Disorder Alliance and KBHN Deputy Scientific Officer, Jennifer Zwicker. A big shout out to our silver sponsor, the Azreli Foundation, who is the sponsor of this session. Over to you, Jonathan and Jennifer. Thanks, Dr. Goldman. As we begin this final panel, I want to first recognize, as we did at the beginning of this conference and throughout, that CASDA and all our panel members here today live and work in various places across the country. And today, I personally am speaking to you from the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, colonially known as Toronto. This is in the uh, dish with one spoon territory, a treaty that is that binds these three First Nations together that share this territory with us and protect the land. So I hope right now and throughout this conference, you had time to reflect on the privilege and the responsibility that it is to be here on ceded or unceded lands and engage with one another across this land, wherever you're tuning in from. Over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, John. Uh, so welcome, everybody. And uh, we're really excited to share with you uh, some of the hard work that's been going on around the National Autism Strategy. Um, federal government announced its commitment to develop a National Autism Strategy. And the Canadian Autism Spectrum Disorder Alliance, or CASDA, has been very active in supporting the creation of the strategy. You're going to hear a bit more about some of these, these pillars as part of the CASDA blueprint. But just so you have a bit of background on this initiative, Kids Brain Health Network partnered with CASDA and launched uh, policy fellowships. And we actually launched them back in January, um, just pre kind of pre and during the start of the pandemic. And this, these were, uh, people could apply to them and we selected uh, five policy fellows who are trainees and research staff. The intention was to provide an opportunity for researchers to really lend their research skills and broaden their experience and skill sets um, really to contribute to this important initiative and gain experience um, in policy development. So it's kind of a win-win on both sides. And like I said, we launched this in January and I have to say these policy fellows have accomplished an astonishing amount in partnership with the CASDA board members um, that have co-chaired the working group. So, um, we're really excited to share some of the, the findings and have some discussion with the panelists and I'll pass it off to John to give a little bit more background on the National Autism Strategy to date. Yeah, so just to give an introduction to many of you who might not know of CASDA, uh, CASDA has been around for over a decade and really uh, it's an umbrella uh, of uh, organizations in autism and uh, that are concerned and uh, focused on a national autism strategy, calling that to action and uh, developing something that's comprehensive for the sector. There's been a lot of projects over the years and a, a lot of these organizations have found so much alignment uh, throughout this, uh, in this CASA umbrella. So there's been many years of calling for a national autism strategy. Now one has been action uh, uh, in this government and the mandate letter of two cabinet ministers. Notably for this conversation, uh, in 2019, uh, CASA uh, created a blueprint for a national autism strategy, looking at five areas that are under federal jurisdiction. And this year, as, as Jen mentioned, uh, CASA and KBHN came together to build working groups to provide actionable policy recommendations on those blueprint areas. You're going to hear about that uh, in the following presentations. Uh, they did a policy review of international strategies on disabilities and autism strategies around the, around the world and then applying that to Canadian context. Um, so with that, I'm gonna first of all, pass it on to um, our special guest uh, who is able to join us and we're, we're honored to have her here, uh, Jennifer Cobier. Uh, she's from the Public Health Agency of Canada and she's worked in the federal government for many years, for 34 years in the areas of children's <laughs> programs, human resources, human rights and employment equity. 
And since 1999, she's been responsible for the Indigenous Early Ch Ch Child Development Programming at the regional, provincial, and national levels. As of October 19th of this year, she accepted a one-year assignment as the manager of the Neural Developmental uh, Unit at the Public Health Agency. So over to you, Jennifer, to provide some uh, remarks about the National Autism Strategy. Great, thanks, glad to be here. And just to acknowledge that I'm dialing in from the beautiful unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples here in Ottawa. And thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction and for all of you inviting me here to participate on this panel. As you've mentioned, I've assumed this role about four weeks ago as my colleague Martha Vaughn is on assignment. And in, if you could turn the slide, please. So in my role, I have the privilege of supporting a very important ministerial commitment, and that is to work collaboratively with provinces, territories, families, and stakeholders toward the creation of a national autism strategy. While the Public Health Agency is leading this effort, we do work collaboratively with our federal colleagues, particularly with the Employment Social Development Canada, as their minister and the Minister of Health share this commitment to creating a national autism strategy. This ministerial partnership speaks to the broad scope of issues at play in the development of a national strategy, which includes health as well as social and economic aspects. So to further support this federal level collaboration and knowledge exchange, the agency established the Federal Interdepartmental Committee on Autism Spectrum Disorder. In our experience, establishing this type of governance mechanism as a first step allows for a whole of government approach in developing national strategies. Next slide, please. So before talking about the strategy, I thought it was important to outline the agency's existing investments supporting autism spectrum disorder. A critical component of supporting Canadians living with autism and their families is to understand the number and the characteristics of people diagnosed with autism, both across regions and over time. To contribute to this and consistent with the agency's core role for health surveillance, the agency developed the National Autism Surveillance System or the NAS, which is a collaboration with provincial and territorial governments to build a comprehensive picture of autism in Canada. NAS tracks the occurrence and demographic characteristics in children and youth with ASD, including estimates of prevalence, incidents and key characteristics, patterns and trends both over time and across geographic regions. The first inaugural report was released in 2018 and is the first reporting of national data and information which will improve our understanding of Autism in Canada. This report focused on those aged 5 to 17 years from six provinces in one territory, specifically Newfoundland, Labrador, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Quebec, British Columbia and the Yukon. A second area that the agency has focused its attention on is in supporting the Canadian Pediatric Society to develop clinical assessment guidelines for autism, which were released last October. These guidelines provide clear, comprehensive, evidence-informed recommendations and tools for community pediatricians and other primary care providers, contributing to improvements in early detection, screening and diagnosis, as well as early intervention. Next slide, please. As most of you probably know, Budget 2018 announced $20 million in funding over five years for two new initiatives, the Strategic Fund and an investment in Aid Canada. The Strategic Fund will allocate $9.1 million over five years to support community-based projects that provide opportunities for individuals living with autism, their families and caregivers to gain knowledge, resources and skills at different stages of their lives. In 2018, the agency launched the first open call for proposals and funded a total of eight multi-year projects that address a range of topics from mental health, sexual health and transition to employment, to name a few. As a five-year funding investment, the agency will launch a second and final open call for proposals to allocate the remaining funding. More information on the timing and details of this solicitation will be available in the near future. A second important initiative that was funded through Budget 2018 is the Autism and Intellectual Disabilities Knowledge Exchange Network, or Aid Canada. Aid Canada is a national knowledge network that is committed to providing accurate, up-to-date and useful information and resources. Aid Canada offers information, tools and resources about autism and intellectual disabilities across the lifespan. 
Their bilingual website is live and is maintained with the help of a team of researchers and persons with lived experience to make sure that the information is accurate, useful, and can be considered a trusted source that is easy to access. Aid Canada also has six hubs across the country to provide a physical space for families, parents, and caregivers to visit, obtain information, and borrow materials. The hubs support knowledge dissemination, the sharing of best practice across the country, and are located in Quebec, British Columbia, Yukon, Alberta, Ontario, and in Atlantic Canada, and operate and supported by partner organizations that support individuals with autism in those areas. Next slide, please. Similar to the Strategic Fund, which address a multitude of issues ranging from mental health to employment, the creation of a national autism strategy will consider the many aspects of autism across the life course in order to resonate with all autistic Canadians and their families. As I mentioned earlier, the agency established a federal interdepartmental committee to ensure a whole of government approach in the creation of this strategy. This committee identified themes that will serve as lines of inquiry to guide the broad and extensive consultation engagement process. These themes recognize the many interconnected social, economic, environmental, and cultural factors that affect the health of autistic Canadians, such as income, level of education, occupation, and housing, to name a few. The Interdepartmental Committee identified three key themes of social inclusion, economic inclusion, and evidence-based interventions. On October 27th, the Minister of Health announced that the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences will be the organization to lead the broad and extensive engagement that will help to inform the strategy. The CAHS is a charitable, not-for-profit, and neutral organization that conducts research, engagement, and develops evidence-based conclusions on a range of complex health and health-related issues of importance to Canadians. Guided by the three key themes of social inclusion, economic inclusion, and an evidence-based interventions, the CAHS will gather and analyze the evidence and perspectives that will form the backdrop of the National Autism Strategy development. Next slide, please. Over the course of the next 16 months, the CHS will be leading a broad, extensive engagement process to inform the National Autism Strategy that will involve, involve a scoping phase, consultation phase, and reporting. Scoping will be a comprehensive review of information and evidence on various perspectives and issues. The consultation will include surveys, focus groups, an online forum, and an engagement session, all culminating at a report in January of 2022. Next slide, please. This slide is an infographic created by CAHS to illustrate the various activities, phasing, and timing of their activities. If you are unable to see it on this slide, you are welcome to visit their website, which will provide the same infographic. As a first step, the CHS will be establishing an oversight panel and three working groups, one for each of the three themes of social inclusion, economic inclusion, and evidence-based interventions. Earlier this week on November 10th, they announced Dr. Lonnie, Lonnie Zweigenbaum as the chair of the oversight panel. In this role, the, he will lead the academic, scientific, and knowledge work of the assessment. Three working groups will support the consultation engagement process, and the working group members will be sought out amongst experts with a focus on impartiality and, and credibility, as well as be as diverse as possible represented through gender, age, geography, race, culture, language, work domain, and more. These working groups will look at gathering evidence through the various stages of the process and will play a key role in the development of central themes. For example, best practices and guidance that will inform the final report. The CHS has indicated that members of the autism community will be included on the panel and working groups and will be identified through an open call to stakeholders, which has just been launched. They will be employing a variety of mechanisms to consult and engage through a national survey, virtual stakeholder engagement sessions, and focus groups. As more information on the nature and timing of these activities, CAH will continue to update their website and the Public Health Agency of Canada will continue to support and disseminate these activities with updates on our own Government of Canada website. Thank you and we look forward to hearing more about views and 
diverse perspectives in developing the National Autism Strategy. And I think the following panel discussions will identify some of the additional information to be considered as this strategy gets developed. So turning it over back to Jonathan. Great, thank you, Jennifer. We're happy to uh, continue to work with you and supporting your FAC team uh, in, in this process and supporting uh, the, the process from the CAHS consultation. And that's led by our dear friend, Dr. Lonnie Zweigenbaum, who himself is a KBHN researcher uh, for many years and to really to develop an effective strategy uh, for autistics and their families across the country. It's urgently needed and um, scalable to many other disability groups as well. Um, government and civil society partnerships are so important uh, to work on such complex issues as what we see in the autism sector. So right now, I would like to introduce our panel members um, who will be on screen showing up right now. Yep, there they are. So uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce the CASDA uh, board members who have been co-chairing uh, these working groups with the uh, trainees uh, from KBHN. So uh, Debbie Irish, uh, she's the chair of CASDA uh, in her day job, the chief operating officer at the Canadian Council of Rehab and Work. Uh, Natalie Garson, the Vice Chair of CASDA, uh, the Principal at Spectrum, uh, at Clinic Spectrum. Joe Farber, the other Vice Chair of CASDA, and she's the Executive Director of Autism Speaks Canada. We have Brooke Pinsky, uh, one of our Board Members and Director, and she's the support, uh, Supports Lead at Autism Edmonton. And Leslie Peters, who's a former Director at CASDA, uh, she was also the Executive Director at Autism Yukon, and now currently doing graduate studies uh, at UBC. And I'll pass it over to the gents to introduce the uh, policy fellows. Great, thank you. And maybe I'll get the fellows to wave when, uh, just so we can locate who's who in this uh, screen. Uh, so first up we have uh, Daljeet Gill, who's a Healthy Communities Manager at the City of Surrey and a doctoral candidate at UBC. Uh, Brittany Finley, who's a Research Associate at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. Uh, Vanessa Tomas, who you saw earlier today and uh, moderating our panel and is a student at the University of Toronto, PhD student. Uh, Carolyn Abel, who's a Master's of Public Health student at uh, New York University. And Stephen, Dr. Stephen Gentles, who's a postdoctoral CHR Health System Impact Fellow at Autism Ontario and McMaster University. So um, those are our, that's our awesome panel that's going to uh, get us going today. And um, what we're going to do now is move into uh, presentations on each part of the, the National Autism Strategy aligned with that blueprint that John spoke to. And we're going to go in sequence with the presentations with one of the policy fellows and uh, the CASDA co-chair, CASDA board member co-chairs um, leading presentations. So we'll hand it over to the presenters. Good afternoon. I'm Deljeet Gilbadesha, one of the Policy Fellows and a doctoral student at the University of British Columbia. I'm here with Dr. Natalie Garçon, who is Vice Chair of CASTA. We are both the co-chairs of the Research and Governance Working Group, and our group is comprised of eight members who have experience in policy development at CASTA and broadly, programs in clinical services, and other grad students. Our group started with developing an understanding of the issues at play. Many programs that support autistic individuals are funded and delivered at the provincial and territorial levels. Because of this, there's a lack of information sharing between the federal government and these partners. And this leads to inconsistent application of the research and program types available within the local regions. And ultimately, this results in fragmented services and knowledge sharing across the nation. We do not have a national set of standards on research programs and evaluation to provide consistent supports for autistic Canadians and their families across the lifespan. This is because the federal government does not have a mechanism to support this type of communication and coordination across the regions to share the knowledge and metrics. So our recommendation is to establish a governance structure that incorporates research and can be activated to support federal leadership to undertake the development of a national strategy and builds on the current ways in which the federal government already works across the nation. 
It also builds on the other areas of federal interest and priorities, such as the Pan-Canadian Strategy for Disability and Work, Bill C-81, and the government's commitment to the development of a national autism strategy as articulated in ministerial mandate letters. Building on this, our working group went through an extensive process of reviewing research, international comparisons, and an examination of Canada-wide commitments and community priorities related to autism. This led us to develop our top three recommendations that will support the successful implementation and evaluation of a national strategy on autism. In other countries, a strong structure for communication across their regions, having mechanisms for national data collection, research and policy improvements emerged as the key elements for advanced strategic work. So we saw this as an opportunity to create a national data set that extends beyond the current epidemiological information and allows government to have national level data that can drive research, practice and decision making. While we recognize that the federal government may have little purview over the design and delivery of the programs delivered within the provinces and territories, we acknowledge the federal government provides leadership and investment that can be coordinated and measured across all areas of support for autistic Canadians. To this end, our, community, our committee recommends the creation of a cross-governmental leadership coordinating commission. This can be an independent government agency, such as a national interagency coordinating commission of autism. In order to provide government with arm's length guidance to, key, to make key and informed leadership decisions. Next, we recommend the implementation of a partnership framework between the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in order to share information and provide consistent services across the regions. This way, all autistic Canadians should receive the same high quality service in any part of Canada, and this partnership sets the stage to make this happen. And finally, we recommend that government create and fund multidisciplinary centers for excellence in autism research. These centers will inform and evaluate policy and training for those sectors directly serving autistic Canadians and those in non-traditional sectors but have significant touch points. This recommendation integrates knowledge and training at the regional levels. In the policy brief, we have provided some examples for this. We believe these three recommendations will support all five pillars of the CASDA blueprint. As we work through developing these three recommendations into policy brief number one, we observed there was overlap in some key actions in the different working groups related to working with the federal relationship and the provinces and territories. And so we pulled those into one foundational brief that would support all five areas of the, bl of the blueprint. Policy brief number two summarizes these actions. The policy brief process was very collaborative and iterative. And next, Natalie will describe how the working group process went. Thank you so much, Daljeet. I'm joining you all from Montreal. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So uh, the slide in front of you shows our working group process. It was an iterative, iterative process uh, amongst all the uh, committee members, and it was a very active committee. Um, so the first activity was to brainstorm. The first few meetings consisted of brainstorming the issues and really understanding the type of research that would inform governance as opposed to research for programs. So uh, we had to bring a lot of our committee levels up to a higher level, you know, so that they'd understand that we were talking about governance. And um, we did a literature scope to see what was being done, as Daljeet has already mentioned, in other nations. The role of the co-chairs, so Daljeet and I, was to seek understanding and views of diverse groups of members, because our committee was very diverse, and to meet with the members one-on-one -on -one when it was necessary. So our role was to build consensus. <laughs> so um, during our meetings, our role was to build consensus on three broad recommendations that Daljeet has presented. Um, we had to agree on the recommendations and then um, we used um, multiple iterations and endpoints for the working group um, so that we could work together. Um, we used an online uh, document uh, program, which allowed us all to work on the document together and so that we could follow the iterations, different iterations of the document as it progressed. We did this during our group meetings, between our group meetings, um, within the brief, as well as outside the brief. And then finally, towards the final versions of the policy brief, 
we took turns. So each writer was um, given a specific amount of time that they could use to go through the brief and to make sure that it had their input as registered. So it was really quite an iterative process. Um, we also, as co-chairs, uh, went through the document um, together as well as on our own to make sure that it was consistent and that it flowed properly. Finally, we had to coordinate the content of the brief with the other pillars to ensure that there wasn't duplication. And this is something that Daljeet was able to do with the other uh, policy individuals and with Jonathan Lai, and because we wanted to make sure that there wasn't duplication. So the working group policy briefs were foundational to the NAS, um, so lots of coordination with the other groups. Next slide. So what did we learn? Um, working group engagement, challenges, and key learnings. So the challenge is that research, of course, and governance area are broad and very multi-tiered. So we really had to focus in in order to meet our deadlines. Um, so we had to sift through a lot of committee recommendations and to sort through input that was re uh, relevant for governance only, because we were getting a lot of input in terms of things that were interesting for other research groups, but didn't necessarily fit into this policy group. Um, discussions were very broad and diverse, so Daljeet and I really had to take very open-end discussions and contain the working group meeting uh, within the time allowance. Um, and therefore, we had to steer and create a discussion uh, to get us to our goal of a draft pol policy. It was incredible. Uh, we had a very active group, um, and we would often uh, go over the time that we had allotted to ourselves because we were very engaged in discussions, um, as in our minds, we could see how this could go about positively affecting Canadians um, in terms of the autism realm. So that was wonderful. And it really helped for us to find a Canadian example. And we found the dementia strategy to be very helpful um, and to take international contexts um, as well that we were able to find and apply them locally. Finally, um, we did have some ideas um, that were important in terms of our policy brief. However, we felt would better inform other working groups. So when this occurred, we liaised with other working group chairs we invited them to come to our working group to hear some of what our ideas were. And in some instances, the other briefing groups took off with the ideas because they were more pertinent to theirs. That was our cross-pollination uh, program. So for one example, we were really interested in how big data or computer learning could help to inform policy uh, and governance. And, uh, but that was taken over by the research working group. We're very thankful to have this opportunity to work with individuals from across Canada. And we've got to say that using a platform such as Zoom and using Google Docs, for example, was helpful in terms of breaking, bringing us together as a group and also producing a document collaboratively together. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to attend our session. My name is Brittany and I, along with my co-chair, Brooke, I'm going to be discussing learnings and findings from the policy development process for the National Autism Strategy. We will discuss our experiences conducting working group meetings and developing policy briefs for the affordability and access focus area of the strategy. Our presentation will first discuss the process of engaging with stakeholders and community members in working group meetings to develop recommendations for the National Autism Strategy. Next, we'll provide an overview of the policy briefs developed by this group and provide examples of the recommendations included in these briefs. To conclude, we will discuss challenges and key learnings from the working group engagement process. To develop recommendations and policy briefs for the federal government for the National Autism Strategy, Brooke and I led five working group meetings with stakeholders and community members with a variety of different professional and personal experience with the autism community. We began the engagement by brainstorming a comprehensive list of the issues and challenges related to affordability ability and access that autistic Canadians and their families face that make accessing the supports and services that they need a challenge. This step provided context of the real issues facing the autism community in Canada and created an understanding among all group members of the challenges our work was aiming to address. We analyzed issues and challenges from this list into areas of federal jurisdiction and provincial jurisdiction. The purpose of this step was to focus discussion on issues that were within federal mandates. 
Once our issues were organized, we began to identify federal policy levers that could address these issues and challenges. For the purposes of this working group, we defined federal policy levers as any tools the federal government has at their disposal to direct, manage, and shape changes in public services, such as laws, regulations, programs, and strategic plans, among others. This step was to help the group shift their thinking from issues to solutions in the form of actions from the, for the government to take. Our final list of federal levers was comprehensive and included levers specific to the autism community, levers that were implemented to support other populations, but that could be modified to support autistic individuals, and levers that were implemented in other countries and jurisdictions. Working group members were then tasked with independently researching at least one of the federal policies identified during our discussion. The aim of this research was to determine opportunities for changes to existing policy levers, opportunities for enhanced government accountability to existing initiatives, and to learn more about policy levers that could be implemented to address challenges. When the research was completed, we discussed all the policy levers and determined which were both feasible to implement by government and which would best address the issues that we brainstormed in step one of the engagement process. Chosen policy levers were translated into recommendations, each including specific action items for the federal government. Our final step was to organize the recommendations we developed into five affordability and access policy briefs, each addressing a specific set of challenges facing the autism community in Canada. I will now hand it over to my co-chair, Brooke, who will provide an overview of what our group produced. Thank you, Brittany. Brief one and two focused on federal disability tax measures. Autistic Canadians face higher the, uh, costs of living while also being more likely to be living at a low income level. The aim of these tax measures is to partially offset the additional costs associated with the diagnosis of a disability. Sadly, there are many problems with them and autistic Canadians report barriers to much needed support. Our first brief focuses on increasing awareness of existing tax measures, as well as modifying specific measures, including the medical expenses tax credit, disability supports deduction, child care expenses deduction, and most importantly, the disability tax credit, which was addressed in detail in our second policy brief. We recommended the disability tax credit be reformed with changes to the application process, frequency of reapplication, as well as making the tax credit refundable to ensure it provides support to autistic people and families with low incomes. The third policy brief focused on recommendations to help autistic Canadians access the services and professionals needed to reach their full, full and equal potential in all aspects of society. Our recommendations focused on enhancing training for professionals, reducing wait times for services, and increased access to mental health supports. The fourth policy brief focused on federal leadership by outlining action items for a future first minister's meeting that reflected key concerns related to access and affordability at the provincial and ter territorial levels. Our fifth policy brief focused on action items aimed to increase access to early intervention throughout the country and monitor the development developmental health of autistic children over time. Overall, we think the process of engaging stakeholders and community members to develop policy recommendations is essential to ensuring recommendations align with the needs of the autism community and that they are addressing actual challenges that Canadians face in their daily lives. While this process overall was very rewarding and instrumental to the development of our briefs, we thought we would take some time to discuss two of the main challenges we encountered during our working group engagement to facilitate learning among individuals attending this session that plan to do this type of work in the future. The challenge was shifting conversations from being problem-oriented to solution-oriented. As co-chairs, the main way we addressed this challenge was to offer our own ideas about possible solutions to problems. We found that providing an idea to the group would often prompt group members to provide feedback or would spark inspiration for new ideas, which produced a robust and focused discussion among the group. Our second main challenge was to focus recommendations specifically on the affordability and access focus area of the National Autism Strategy. We found that our discussions around issues relating to affordability and access and action items to address these issues often overlap with the other focus areas, particularly the areas of research and governance 
housing, and information. To address this challenge, we participated in several meetings with the co-chairs of the other focus areas to ensure our recommendations and briefs did not overlap and that we cross-reference each other's briefs when needed. Communication across the different focus areas was key to ensuring the final document combining all our policy briefs was cohesive and clear across focus areas. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for your attendance and attention this afternoon. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Thomas and I will be presenting today with Debbie Irish to present our findings and key learnings from the policy development process to develop employment related policy briefs to inform Canada's national autism strategy. So what's the current issue? Despite many autistic Canadians being willing, able and eager to work, they face worse employment outcomes compared to their neurotypical peers. In Canada, only 33% of autistic Canadians report being employed. And for those who are employed, they're often what we call underemployed, meaning that they unwillingly work part-time hours, reduced wages, and often in job roles that are below their intellectual potential. So what might influence some of these poor outcomes? We know that there are a lack of suitable and accessible pre-employment supports and programs, as well as we know organizational factors can influence employment outcomes either positively or negatively. For example, policy culture and whether these are inclusive of autistic employees. A focus on competitive integrated employment has been highlighted as a priority area for immediate federal action by Canadian stakeholders, specifically a focus on inclusive workplaces and pre-employment programs. As such, these are the target of our two employment policy briefs. So for pre-employment, pre-employment programs are not restricted to adolescents with autism, but instead should be targeted towards individuals with autism across the lifespan of all functional and cognitive abilities. And these programs can include different types of training, such as training in life skills, so executive functioning and social skills, as well as job readiness and on the job training. So for our pre-employment policy brief, we developed four key recommendations. So I'm going to provide you with some examples from the different recommendations that are provided on this slide. So first, pre-employment, um, we suggest that the federal government reinvests in and continues longer term investments of federally funded pre-employment programs, such as Employment Works. Second, through programs that are supported at the federal level, we, we suggest the prioritization of having an autism specific lens, encouraging upscaling across Canada and embedding at the high school and post-secondary level to assist with that transition to employment. So for example, programs like community works or school works. Third, we suggest allocation of portions of pre-existing funding programs to be specific for and assist individuals with autism entering the workforce to support pre-employment programs. So for example, the youth employment and skill strategy. We suggest to coordinate program evaluations and sharing of key indicators across programs. So example indica indicators could include an increase in competitive employment placements, job retention, and potential for job promotion and upward mobility. The next brief looks at inclusive workplaces. And what do we mean by inclusive workplaces? So these are environments that optimize and foster development of employment related skills and success. It's where the strength, skills and diversity of autistic individuals are recognized and celebrated. And so for our inclusive, uh, inclusive Workplaces Employment Policy Briefs, we developed five key recommendations. So again, I will provide examples embedded within these recommendations that are provided on each of the slides. So first, we suggest to incorporate autism-specific training into initiatives like the Canada-Ontario Job Grant and similar pan-Canadian programs. We suggest that to create opportunities that have an autism specific focus within the Enabling Accessibility Fund or to develop similar funding opportunities that are autism specific. It's important to know, however, that many autistic employees do not require extensive or costly accommodations or adjustments and could be as simple as usage of headphones. Other autistic employees who have multiple or dual diagnoses might require some more complex supports and thus it's important to have funds available. 
We also suggest to create cross-ministry collaborations using components of accessibility legislation to ensure employers follow and embed best practice models of recruiting, selecting, hiring, onboarding, and retention. And finally, we suggest first best practices that have been developed for remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic should be utilized to support and promote remote work options for employees with autism. And then we suggest to allow for the reallocation of wage subsidy funds used by Canadian employers and companies and different organizations to allow for selection of workplace supports. So now I'm going to pass it over to my co-presenter, Debbie, who's going to talk about key learnings throughout the policy development and working group process. Thank you, Vanessa. I'd like to talk about two key learnings. The first being working group engagement. We had a very engaged group that met monthly to discuss the issues at hand. However, we found that in between meetings, we weren't able to engage the group as much as we would have liked to. During those periods, we would have liked to have shared resources and created dialogue through our Slack channel. However, one of the things we thought about for a solution would be to think about proactively, what are those methods and opportunities for engagement? And the other piece is understanding and discussing the scope of knowledge and expertise amongst our working group members prior to the start of this process. The second key learning was navigating different opinions and experiences. And again, we had a working group uh, that had very varied experience from lived experience to for-profit organizations to not-for-profit organizations. Managing the meeting priorities with this type of diversity of perspectives and opinions became challenging for Vanessa and I at times. I think as a solution, we needed to set tighter priorities for the meeting, inform the group ahead of time of the goals of the briefs, and ensure understanding of what recommendations would fall under federal jurisdiction. And again, ensuring that all opinions and experienced were voiced and heard. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carolyn, and um, along with Jill, I was the co-chair for the housing group. And I also just wanted to mention um, Amy Lonsberry as um, another key member of our working group. So first, um, the two key issues that we focus on um, and which form the basis of two policy briefs were that there are limited housing supply options for people with developmental disabilities, which is compounded by a lack of autism specific supports. And the second being that many autistic adults do not have sufficient income through either employment or social assistance in order to live independently. So for the purpose of our policy briefs, we divided this population further into three subgroups. The first being those that require 24 seven care, the second who need two to six hours a day of support, and the third being those that can live on their own and are able to have a job but do need occasional help. Um, our first policy brief on supply issues um, involved four recommendations. Um, the first being to expand um, the current indicators used for inclusive housing to include persons with, dis with developmental disabilities. Um, and this was in alignment with the indicator model developed by Inclusion Canada, formerly the Canadian Association for Community Living, uh, to be more inclusive to non-physical disabilities. Um, the second recommendation is to develop building connections between affordable housing developers and service agencies. Um, the third um, is to provide regular public um, progress reports on the status of housing that meets um, that indicator framework. And the fourth is to appoint autistic representation to the National Housing Council, which has yet to be announced by the federal government. Our second policy brief on income uh, involved three recommendations. Um, we recommend that the federal government um, convene a federal provincial territorial working group to design a disability supplement to the Canada Housing Benefit to account for the increased costs of living with a disability. 
Um, the second recommendation is to work with the provinces and municipalities on affordable and stable rent control, because we know that people with disabilities have lower incomes than the rest of the population. Um, and so this will benefit them um, more than the average um, person. And the third is to implement the recommendations from the Funded Solutions Lab um, titled Designing a Registered Disability Savings Plan Home Ownership Plan um, to make that function um, more similarly to the RRSP Home Buyers Plan. Some key learnings from the working group process. Um, we found that it was helpful to list out existing federal initiatives and promises outlined in the National Housing Strategy and other policy, um, because there, were, there was significant um, infrastructure already in place in the housing um, landscape, and housing is a very broad topic in general. Um, it was helpful to identify opportunities for accountability or where local and provincial models can be scaled up, up to the federal level. Um, and then prioritizing short, medium, and long-term actions for the federal government uh, to act on. Sorry. sorry. Um, uh, our second, sorry, second set of key learnings involved navigating um, different working group members' experiences. Um, and so understanding members' priorities as parents, service providers, um, et cetera, and the different, um, their different priorities that they brought to the table um, and different opinions that they have, that they had and how to integrate those into our recommendations. Uh, the second, to manage the goals, expectations of the policy briefs um, and uh, bring further clarity on uh, what we were asking the federal government to do. Um, and then third, allowing everyone the opportunity to participate in the discussion and provide feedback on the items in our, our policy briefs as we were developing them. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. This policy brief presentation is about the theme information. I'm Steve Gentles, a CIHR Health System Impact Fellowship postdoc at Autism Ontario and McMaster University. Hello, I'm Leslie Peters, and I am a past CASDA board member and also the managing consultant for Autism Yukon. Dr. Gentles and I co-chaired this information working group together. It was comprised of 50% autistic self-advocates, as well as interested professionals and two CASDA employees. Information is a broad and ambiguous word, so it was important for our work group to be clear about what we were talking about. The figure on this slide helped by mapping two important cycles where health-related information can be used. The top was the learning health system cycle and the bottom is the interaction between care systems and care users. The three most important types of information from that list on the right included knowledge translation or evidence-based information products, data systems, and information needed to support users to both access and navigate the system. We use these in our three briefs. In the case of information, it made sense for our work group to develop three separate briefs rather than a single brief with a common issue as some of the other working groups did. So we developed three briefs, and these happen to correspond to the three most important types of information that Dr. Gentles mentioned on the previous slide. There was a brief about databases, a brief about information care systems, and also a brief about communicating evidence-based knowledge. Data systems was the topic of our first brief. This addressed the problem of the lack of data standardization and linking between the numerous types of databases that contain information on people with autism. The solution in this brief included making progress towards something called the learning health system with federal government taking some limited actions, namely to encourage provincial and territorial stakeholders to take early steps in coordination with each other toward laying foundations for a national learning health system for autism. 
Our second brief was aimed at addressing the lack of policy relevant information exchange among the provinces and territories, primarily by the bureaucrats and the different ministries that provide autism services in the different provinces and territories. After much discussion, this was an issue that all stakeholders in our group felt was really important. And the theme of provincial and territorial coordination was even relevant to several of the other policy uh, brief groups and was mentioned by them as well. Our proposed solution was for the Public Health Agency of Canada to fund a gap analysis of policymaker information needs and to use the resulting findings to inform federal incentives to encourage coordinated provincial territorial information sharing. We aimed for the sky and we also recommend a first minister's meeting to build cross provincial territorial collaborative approaches. Our third brief was aimed at promoting inclusion for autistic Canadians by focusing on language and communication standards and a public media campaign as a means to improve public attitudes about autism. Language is a is powerful because it influences the way we think about and value people who happen to be autistic. The solutions we promoted in this brief include a public media campaign run by the Public Health Agency of Canada, language standards developed by Accessibility Standards Canada, and training of federal service providers who interact with autistic citizens. The strengths of this brief are that it was developed with the leadership of the four actually autistic members of our group and that the recommendations were probably the most concrete, actionable and achievable of all our briefs. So this brief is arguably um, had the most value for its potential to make a difference. Changing language and attitudes is one of the most fundamental, easiest and impactful steps that the federal government can take towards a national autism strategy. Finally, I'll summarize key learnings from our group. First, extra time was needed to define the different possible meanings of the word information, which is something that slowed the progress of our group compared to other groups, illustrating the complexity of, of what we had to develop briefs for. Second, because our group had different and conflicting needs, there were some tensions about the process, which took extra attention. So for example, on the one hand, there was a legitimate need to keep meetings to an hour to be inclusive of some people's needs. While on the other hand, there was a legitimate need for more time to allow for sufficient engagement and time for people to talk. This was addressed by having breakout rooms to give more air time for people and to engineer optional meeting extensions. Thirdly, the most positive learning was the extra work that Leslie and I did at the beginning to actively seek out additional members um, from the autistic community to fill our group really paid off resulting in brief number three which uh, was divine developed by the autistic members um, and has potential for strong broad impact and these were our work group members So there it is. Thank you to all our uh, uh, presentations. Um, we've seen a lot of excellent work that came out uh, into a compendium that uh, we have published of uh, about 66 pages of, of policy notes. Um, we're going to go straight to our uh, Q&A. Uh, we do have some questions. We also have some live questions. So if you're on the Slido app, you'll be able to answer some, uh, uh, submit some questions as the audience. Um, the first one I'll actually take uh, before I pass it to the panel. Um, so one question asks, how were stakeholders identified, selected, and engaged throughout the process? Um, well, so there was a public announcement through CASDA uh, to join uh, and through KBHN. And basically, we took everybody who joined. It was our first time doing this. We ranked um, their choices between the five different areas. Um, we had about 10, 12 people per group, depending on which group you were in. And some, you know, there are different members that worked on different uh, parts or different subsets of the briefs uh, within those uh, opponents. So uh, I'm going to turn to our panel right now. Um, the first question I have for them uh, is about what Jennifer mentioned. So at the very beginning that there is consultation and development of the National Autism Strategy ongoing through the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. 
Um, what advice do you guys have for researchers and stakeholders here to be involved in that process? I guess you guys can put up your hands um, and we'll choose you. Uh, we'll go with Debbie and then bring you on this one. I would just say that we have to ensure that we, we reach all pockets of Canada to ensure that we get uh, urban response, rural response, remote north, fly in every uh, pocket of Canada, we ensure that we get stakeholder engagement in some format or another to truly understand what the needs are. Thanks, Debbie. Brittany? Hi, yeah. So uh, my piece of advice would be really to just do such a scoping strong review of um, the existing work that has been done. Um, there's a lot that's out there from other stakeholder groups, other community groups about their recommendations for um, avenues for change. And I think that it's really important to leverage in addition to um, talking to new individuals and consulting across the country. I think it's important also to be um, looking at what's already been done. Thanks a lot. Um, so anybody else want to chime in on that one before we go on to our next question? Oh, did I see a hand? Uh, yes. Oh. yes Steve, Steve, go ahead. Um, yeah, my recommendation would be, I, I gather that there lots of outreach is, is happening and there will be lots of autistics uh, included. And I think that's uh, the, the importance of that can't be uh, understated as obvious as it is. But my recommendation might be to go a, a step further and to try to um, engage di a diversity of autistics, which is something that I think is is a is a challenge, in, including you know some of the harder harder to access groups, which will take uh, more work. For sure. For sure. And Jen, uh, we'll go on to the next question. Maybe. Let's see what you have. Sure. So thank you again, everyone, for your presentations. It's so exciting to see the work that you've you've been doing. Um, we uh, the question is really around. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about autism specific recommendations. I wonder if you could reflect on, are there kind of pan disability kind of type uh, recommendations that, you know, resonate for across disabilities and what is autism specific? So kind of trying to distinguish, you know, do you think there's learnings for kind of other, other disability uh, groups to align with or can you just putting some of that in context for people who wants to take that as a starting? Yeah, uh, Vanessa, you go and then, yeah. There we go, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I think speaking to that, I would say um, yes and no. So like I'm thinking about the Pan-Canadian Strategy for Disability and Work, and one of their key pieces was on inclusive workplaces. And I think pieces of this can be addressed and um, assist with autistic employees as well. But I do think components do need to be specific also. So like if we're thinking about employer training, so having training specific on autism and the unique challenges and barriers that they do face in the workplace. So as, like I mentioned in my presentation, there's still a lot of gaps that need to be addressed. And so something isn't working. So we do need to have those autism specific strategies. And then I think specific to pre-employment as well. I think those programs, there do need to be tailored components um, to uh, autistic employees. Thank you. And then I think Nat Natalie, you had a comment? I did. Go ahead. Um, you know, certainly when we we're working on this, um, we had a very autism specific lens, but we certainly believe that our work can be scalable to people with other neurodevelopmental disabilities um, across the landscape. And certainly for both Daljeet and I, who are working on the research and governance piece, I mean, that is certainly one of the pillars that is most scalable um, to other populations. Um, however, you know, it's important to start somewhere and we have to be able to learn from each other. And that's exactly what we did. So we went and looked at um, the ways that people were functioning in other nations um, with an autism specific lens as well as without so that we could compare and contrast and have a very strong foundation uh, on which to build here in Canada. Thank you. And we have Jill and then Steve. Jill, go ahead. 
So um, in the in the policy um, briefs that Carolyn described under housing, there was one specific to income. And I think um, the importance of that is that it is sort of truly, when we looked at it, it could be pan disability, very much so. So the three recommendations that came out was um, convene and a working group designed disability supplement and the Canadian housing benefits, um, uh, uh, work with provinces and municipality on affordable, stable rent control, and then um, design a registered disability savings plan. So all of our recommendations really was pan disability. I think the most important piece on top of those recommendations or the caveat is to make sure that autistics are still access those um, those economic benefits um, um, if, if developed as a pan disability, I think it's just really important to identify that we need to make sure that the measures or the, the access to those um, are, are also available for autistics um, across the spectrum. Uh, so um, that, that would be the, the variation with that policy brief. Thank you. And then Steve, did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to um, mention one of the information groups briefs that was kind of more broadly relevant to at a pan disability level, and that was our final brief, which can be found as as the last brief in the um, policy sixty six page called policy compendium, which is accessible on the CASDA website. Um, that was developed by um, the the four actually autistic stake, stakeholders in our, in our group um, and led by, by them. Um, so I think it's worth, worth listening to. And it, it was focused on language standards and um, specifically, I guess, um, using strengths, respectful and strengths-based language. So there's, there's language standards for, for example, indigenous language, language standards uh, produced, you know, to inform journalists. Um, CASDA has uh, language standards for, for autism. Uh, so I think having, uh, you know, aut autistic strengths-based language standards would also be applied to, applicable to other disabilities. Yeah, thank you. All right, John, back to you. Yep, so yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Steve. Yeah, we do have a language guide uh, written by an autistic and uh, shared around about uh, language uh, used uh, in autism um, and looking at sort of the best practices from around the world. And we have that on our website as well. So thanks for bringing that up, Steve. Uh, our next question is uh, for the panel, you know, and a lot of uh, people on this call, uh, on this conference are, are trainees and about learning. So. As you, what did you learn from the process of uh, conducting of research and consultation as policy fellows? So, what are the fellows with this one? And what advice would you give? And what would you do differently next time? Delji, sure, I can start. Um, I think there was a lot of learnings. Um, I would say um, from our from my working group area, uh, because it was so broad, there was a lot of um, broad inputs into the policy development and then programmatic. And so it was holding space for uh, several types of knowledge bases to come together and then to lift everyone up um, to stay focused on our particular policy brief um, and then sharing information across um, and really working with the other policy fellows in a very coordinated way is very helpful. Um, I would also say the time commitment is always much more significant than we initially expect, both for yourselves as a policy fellow, but also for your working group. Our working group was so generous with their time. And for me as a policy fellow to go back to them over and over again with iterations of the policy, it's, you know, so it's, so it's front loading the work, but ensuring that towards the end there, you know that there's a lot more time than you will ever expect to be taken um, to get to the point of uh, a solid policy draft. And it's really important work. So taking that time is really meaningful. Thanks, Delji. Anyone else on that question? Yeah, Brittany. Hi, yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things I learned is just the importance of really um, trying to build relationships with your working group members and determining the ways that work best for them to contribute to the process. So we had working group meetings and that was a really great forum to have discussion 
Um, but then we had lots of offline discussion on um, Google Docs or on Slack channel or, or other over email. And that was really great because um, sometimes people maybe aren't comfortable saying something in a you know video call setting. And so I thought it was really uh, great to be understanding how uh, other people work best and then working with that to ensure that the consultation process is as meaningful and impactful um, as possible. Thank you. For sure, there's a lot of like core competencies, I would call it, uh, in terms of that learning. Leslie? Hi, I think that I would ensure or try to ensure that future attendees of future committees could have a clear view of what the different levels of government can or can't do before the committee, the formal committee actually starts. Um, we spent a lot of time weeding through a lot of suggestions that weren't even possible to approach because they they weren't for the different levels of government that we were discussing. Um, and I think also a good idea would be to hand out sample policy briefs from other sectors or ones that the ones that have now been prepared as samples in future committees so that um, committee members could have a clear idea of what the end product should be. And for sure, now we do have a, a big sample for this next round, um, which we'll talk about soon. Um, Jen, over to you for the next question. Sure. Um, so one of our questions is around, and this would be uh, particularly to the, the CASDA board member co-chairs, um, Thinking about uh, what was your experience like working with researchers and what did you learn in the process um, and any advice on kind of that partnership. So I don't know if we want to maybe go to anyone else want anyone want to start us off. We haven't heard from. Uh, yeah, Jill, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, I thought it was a, a, a great experience. I mean, two very different um, two very different experiences and or brains, how we work coming together. So I'm um, trying to figure out what we could both add to the, to the, to the, um, to the table was, was interesting. Um, I think, uh, again, I would, I would reinforce what Leslie said, sort of that structure, um, understanding or modeling from a structure is really important because we, um, you know, two people coming from two different industries have a different um, outlook on what the end goal should look like. Um, and so making sure that we had some sort of coming in at the same platform would, would be helpful. Um, and then uh, I thought one of the things that Carolyn and I specifically um, was able to do, were able to do together was we looked at things that were already existing. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we wrote wasn't rebuilding the wheel, but that we worked forward from what was existing. Um, and I think that our, our working group really um, um, uh, was able to work well because of that. So we all went away in the first little bit to go and read and get the same foundational knowledge coming in from the same foundational knowledge so that we would work towards something together, um, understanding what was already there and what we, we, we could recommend based on what was already there. So it was very easy for us because there's a whole housing sort of initiative at the federal level. So for us, it was quite, um, easy to work like that. Um, but I think once we got our heads around that that was, that was a good idea for structure. Um, but I would say that that took us a while to get to. So maybe having someone in the lead to get to us to that point before the working group starts would have been, would have been uh, great. But, but in, the, in the end, it was a good process as well. Thank you. Yeah, Brooke? Um, I think with our group, uh, I found um, it really helpful to work with the KBHN policy fellows. Um, we didn't have any issues engaging the working group members when it came to identifying concerns. Um, however, it became more difficult at the point when you began um, working on generating solutions. Um, and having that uh, that voice that was a bit more objective and a bit more removed um, to be able to keep us focused on uh, generating solutions. Um, also to help us because affordability and access is such a broad uh, topic and there were so many uh, different policy levers identified. Um, having that uh, dedicated person to help us 
distribute that work that workflow and help help us um, um, segment things off uh, to do more in depth research based on the specific strength and skills of the individual working group members was in, really invaluable. That's really great to hear. Uh, Debbie, yeah, go ahead. So I would say, first of all, I absolutely loved working with Vanessa. Um, I, I as, as having spent a number of years of my career uh, now, I am much older than Vanessa, obviously, but um, I think when I think about the next generation uh, coming into the field of autism, I feel like it's in very good hands. Um, that is the one piece that I want to say that there was... Uh, a natural curiosity and a desire to uh, take in information, make the connections, and uh, be able to then look at what are the applications more broadly than just, you know, do a policy paper, but how will this actually make changes for the future? So um, uh, for me, I, I, it was a great experience and um, I feel really excited about what the five fellows uh, that are on the screen today will contribute to the, uh, the world of autism going forward. Thank you. We're so excited too. And it's, it's really great to see, um, you know, trainees kind of have that opportunity to work in the policy space. And I think it's a demonstration of how researchers really can engage in this process. And, you know, we're, we're excited to let you know, we're planning to do more of these types of um, fellowships in, in the policy arena from Kids Brain Health Network and working with TASDA and other partners. So you know, I think it's just, we just are really thankful for everybody's a great example of kind of how this can work, work really well. Um, John, did you want to take another question? I think we have a couple from the Q&A as well. Sure, why don't I take a look at that? Uh, one sec here. Just got to get my phone to refresh. Oh, do you want me to, you want me to take one? Um, I guess, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just kind of jump in. I think the, one of the biggest training opportunities uh, for this was that realizing the complexity that it is to do, you know, real true advocacy work and make, make some systems change, right? There's not one solution, you know, Brooke talked about real world problems versus the policy levers and realizing that top down approaches will not solve everything. There's no one place where all these issues are controlled by and there's a lot of complexities around that. And I think um, we really see that experience as we're trying to mull and kind of get through the muck of, okay, what are the problems we're talking about? What are the actual tangible policy uh, actions that can uh, can use to address those? Um, yeah, do we have another question there, Jennifer? Yeah, uh, so uh, to summarize some of the questions, I would say that one of the, the theme of it, I would say, is the how do you engage multiple perspectives? So a family perspective, perspective of um, autistics, uh, how do you, how did you find was, what, what did you have around recommendations around how to engage these diverse perspectives in the, the working groups you had? And I guess that would be advice, particularly for our friends at the um, in the groups that are going to take this work on in the um, Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Anyone want to want to step in there? Yeah, Debbie, go ahead. And then Carolyn, we'll go down with Debbie and Carolyn. Right. So I would just say, and I, and I don't think we encountered this as much in our group, but when I think about our uh, colleagues uh, doing this stakeholder engagement is to really think about all forms of contribution. So there, uh, there will have to be opportunities, obviously, to speak to it, but there will be others that uh, may not have the verbal skills to be able to contribute it. And how can we ensure that their voice is heard? So thinking about alternatives, you know, art, uh, poetry, you know, song, any of those kinds of things, maybe ways in which people are able to express powerful messages uh, that need to be heard in this process. Thank you. That's so important. That's like the different ways of people engaging. Yeah, Carolyn, go ahead. Um, I think it also goes back to um, having a clear understanding of what um, the tools of government are and what they can actually accomplish. Um, and making sure that everyone is on the same page and understands those roles. Um, and also differentiating provincial versus federal versus local um, government. 
what they can do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that is always a challenge in the policy space is kind of, especially with the kind of federal provincial jurisdiction of, of kind of what were some of the recommendations you're gearing towards. Um, so, you know, I guess maybe before we, we were going to take another uh, final reflection from um, Jennifer uh, at the Public Health Agency of Canada. But before we go to that, I just wanted to give anyone here on this call another opportunity. Is there anything else that you wanted to comment on or um, give advice to the audience and those listening um, before we, we wrap up this discussion? Any final burning comments yet? Jill and then Debbie and then Natalie. Yep. Jill, go ahead. So I, I think that this was an amazing experience. I think that we've learned so much and we've come out with, you know, recommendation and documents that can actually be used and, and, and looked back on. So um, both to KBHN and all of the working group members and everybody, a huge thank you. Cause um, it was really a collaborative, um, uh, uh, um, uh, initiative. So a big thank you. And I think um, most of all, I was reading some of the feedback from this, um, from all the working group members, and one really resonated with me that I wanted to share today, that someone said you can find experts in all different places. And sometimes you're quite um, surprised at the expertise that come out when you do an open call for a working group and or um, other type of groups like that. And so it just really resonated me of all the feedback that we got, that one stuck with me. And I just think that it's a great learning that, you know, there are experts in all different in all different places and someone who may work in retail, um, but maybe a parent of an autistic um, person and they've lived through a, a very important transition to housing, you know, independent housing. They have a they have a huge expertise because of their first person perspective on that. And so I just I just want to celebrate that um, experts came out from all different avenues of life in this in this initiative. Thank you. That's that's such a great perspective. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Debbie, go ahead. I was just going to say, for me, I think the piece that was the greatest uh, maybe learning, and we've touched on it a little bit here, and that is don't underestimate the power of context and needing to set context. I think that was the one piece that we heard over and over is we needed to set the context at the beginning around jurisdictional issues, around what the intent of these policy briefs were, what was the outcome we were looking for, what was the uh, expectations of all of the participants. And I think we might have under anticipated how much of that was required. Yeah, thank you. And then last, last word to Natalie, and then we're gonna wrap up with comments from Jennifer. Natalie, go ahead. Thank you. I loved my experience uh, with the Kids uh, Brain Health Network, um, but also with um, you know the Policy Fellows. It was a breath of fresh air. And I think that one of the things that we found in our um, group is that people from not only Canada got excited. So one of our group members was a Canadian, but living in the UK. And she got very excited, which led us to make contact with the National Autistic Society in the UK to learn from them and what they were doing in terms of research and governance, uh, which culminated in a group of us being invited to uh, attend a parliamentary session where autistics were presenting on their own point of view for parliamentarians to get better sensitized to the needs of the population. So I think that what we learned as well is that other people will get excited by the work that we're doing if we go out there and share with them. And so there are great opportunities to work, uh, to learn from each other, yes, here locally at home, even though Daljeet and I were at opposite ends of the country, but also abroad. So these are, um, these are wonderful initiatives to start. Thank you so much. That's a great example. And hopefully we can do something similar in Canada. Um, the, uh, we just, we want to just, first of all, before we go to final comments from Jennifer, we want to just really thank each and every one of you on this call for, first of all, all of your hard work on this, uh, these briefs and your engagement and for participating in this panel. Um, there's a lot more to come on this file and we're excited for what you've contributed so far. John, you want to lead us into the next, next section here? 
Sure, uh, not much more for me to say, but uh, we're glad, we're glad. And I know, um, at, you know, this is Kids Brain Health Network, so it's not just about autism, but, you know, what I would encourage is to see that, you know, this sector has been doing this for a while, and there's a lot of organization alignment that has happened. And, you know, hopefully what we see here will move into the broader neural disability, but also the broader disability space. Um, so in this next set of, you know, we're having conversations about what we can do and build on these briefs, what are autism specific things? What are relevant to other neural developmental conditions? What are relevant to pan disability uh, applications? Uh, as we heard this morning, what are the rights based approaches versus the needs and supports to those specific needs? So there's a lot of there's a lot of room. There's a lot of place to grow. Um, but I'll leave it at that for now, and then we'll hear from Jennifer, and then uh, yeah, excited for what's coming after that as well. Over to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you, and what a wonderful series of presentations. I'd like to start to th by thanking everyone for their participation on this panel and for their insightful presentations. I think the five pillars presented by the policy fellows highlight the broad scope of issues to be considered in developing a national autism strategy. The research and the impressive amount of work done in the development of these presentations will be invaluable in informing a national autism strategy that will resonate with autistic Canadians and will contribute to the planned, broad and inclusive engagement process to be led by CAHS. The five pillars align quite nicely with the three themes of social inclusion, economic inclusion and evidence-based interventions. I think many of you would agree that these are strange and unprecedented times. As you know, the Public Health Agency is leading the government's response to the pandemic. And in the midst of this, we remain committed to moving forward on the development of the National Autism Strategy. I think it's impressive and wonderful to see how quickly we've all been able to adapt to the current circumstances and adjust the way we normally do our work in order to continue to connect with one another virtually, share our knowledge and move forward with very important work. As one of you said quite aptly, there are new ways of working and we've all sort of been evident to how we've been able to do this virtual panel presentation. So thank you very much. I heard today recommendations, I've heard challenges and lessons learned on the issues related to autism. Beyond the practical advice you've shared, I also heard embedded in all of this, the enthusiasm, optimism, the natural curiosity and the interest to work across the areas to address the complexity of issues and ensure that we engage broadly to have diverse perspectives. I've heard about being strengths-based, being mindful of inclusive language, but in particular, including other forms of expression, such as art, poetry, and making sure that we hear from the experts who have lived experience to share. I think I've, it's also important to be solutions-focused and recognize the policy levers and jurisdictions at federal and provincial levels. I've heard from you and your closing statements, the importance of context, which is all good for us to learn. We're, we were reminded about recognizing work already done at all levels and internationally to minimize duplication and leverage efforts. I think my biggest congratulations to all of you and gratitude is for your dedication and the passion that you've contributed in forming the creation of a national autism strategy. And I look forward to the many exciting developments over the course of the coming year. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with you today and to provide some updates on the work that FAC is doing, but more importantly, for the opportunity for me to hear from you as researchers, as people who work in community, with community, to hear what their various perspectives and possible solutions are in addressing the issues for children, families, and people of all ages who are living with autism. So thank you very much. Well done and loved the whole panel presentation. So thank you very much. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Wonderful. Yes, I got Jen and Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. we're everywhere. <laughs> Um, thank, thanks so much, Jennifer, for those words. And I can't tell you how exciting it is to have somebody from the Public Health Agency of Canada on the panel and with such great comments, uh, hearing the, the findings from this work. And we're really excited about where this is going. I just also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Jonathan Lai. He's a, a former KBHN trainee back in, back in the day and 
Um, you know, it's so exciting to have him uh, partnering on this project and leading the charge with uh, CASDA and all the work they're doing. So thanks for your work on this, Jonathan, as well. Um, so now I'm going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Brian Goldman, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Lonnie Zweigenbaum to provide some, some final remarks. So Dr. Goldman, over to you. <laughs> 